Hello explorers and welcome to another video. Today we are going to talk about Slim 4. And Slim 4 is the version of the 3. <laughs> and I actually have a video with uh, using Slim 3 and OpenAPI in order to generate a lot of PHP code to get an API running and also using that with the SQLite database. But this video will be more into Slim 4 and my feelings about it and what have changed to from Slim 3. Um, I have not used this in production or anything like that, but I had a lot of questions or comments about Slim 4 where people wanted me to look into Slim again and look at number 4 instead because it's been improved. So let's look into this. Let's switch over to my screen here. Uh, so first off we have requirements that we need to do. We need to install Composer, we need to install Slim, we need to write some code and then we will profit. So this is the GUI that we want to actually be able to do things in and I, if I type things in here it will be saved and can be reloaded and so on and I can also remove things and add new notes here if I like. So that's what we want to create here and this uh, GUI we have seen many times and what we are implementing is always the API part. So let's go back to the back end here and look at Slim. So first off, I have some use cases here. We have the response and request that you usually have when you are talking about uh, HTTP requests. And then we have some middleware interface because I will write some middlewares. We have a request handler and we have a root context that we can use for the routing and then we can get some information from the context and then the app factory will actually create our application. So we will auto load everything in here so we can use that. And first off we will create our application. So we use the application function, uh, factory and create an app. Then we can add the error middleware and the Adam L error mil middleware is mostly for debugging and for when you are actually developing. So here you see that I've set true, true, true and you can also add a logger if you like. But the first true is display error messages on screen while you are implementing things. So if something breaks in your PHP, it will be displayed on the web page. And then you have log into the logger and log details into the logger as well. I haven't supplied a logger, but I will see that in my um, console window if I get any errors. And then we have some uh, options here that we can route around different option calls. So we can handle the options if you send in questions about uh, does this option, is that allowed? It will actually respond here. And then I will add a little bit of a handler here for the course uh, requirements. And I found this on their webpage. So earlier I had to scour the internet in order to find this little tidbit of information. And this was actually in their um, uh, documentation, so it's much, much easier to find, and also adding middlewares this way, where you can actually just add a function that will return something, also improves things. So here we can take the response and we run the handler, so it will handle the request, and then we return the response down here. And here we see that we add the access origin we add the control allow headers and access control methods. And those are required in order for the web page to say that, okay, you are uh, not really worried about course. You can go from anywhere. And uh, otherwise it needs to be the same domain and so on. After that, I actually implemented some things that will read the body of the message because I will do post messages and so on. So I have this JSON body parser middleware also documented on the site. 
pretty simple. It will look at the content type, ensure that it is JSON, then we'll read the content using the file get contents and the PHP input, decode that JSON, and if we get an error, we will. Uh, well, if we don't get an error, we will actually handle the request, so we get that parsed, and then we will return that as a parsed uh, JSON body, and then I add this middleware here. So now I'm prepared to actually work with my application, and the first thing I do is actually just returning the dbjson as a string if uh, I get a, re a request for the notes. And what I've done is in my DB here, this is a JSON, that is what the actual application is looking for. So I will just read the file and return it. That was a very simple way to do that. And then we have this post that I add to the application. And as I'm not using a database here, I had to write some code in order to facilitate this function. So here we have first off uh, a post message with some request, response and arguments. The arguments are not used. And then I have uh, the data that I read in. I will look through the data and look at the last thing that was written and look at the ID of that because that will probably be the highest ID. In my case, I will not sort them in a different order. So if I add things, it can be removed in between, but I can, the last one should have the largest ID. And then I will create a new one with an ID that is one larger and then set the request body text to that and then push that to the data array. So I get a new post and I will put that down to the file and also encode it and send it out as a request body response. And here I have a function that will find a specific row and this is because I have an ID that I actually use on the site for these messages, but they, in JSON they are just saved as objects in an array and I want to find a specific object row that is that ID. So I will go through each of them, look at the ID and see if that's my note ID, and then I will return that row um, back so I know where to look. And uh, if we look a bit uh, further down here, we can actually see this in action. So here I use this find, I get a row ID back, and then I can set my text there. The function I have up here is just a helper function because I use that a lot and it will take the root context and the request, get the specific root and get an argument of that root. And I thought that the arguments that were sent into the function could be used as um, a mean to get these path arguments, but in a patch and put situation you will not get them on your function body. So I had to implement this little function here. It's also documented, but it was a bit of a hassle to actually find that information. Uh, but if I use this, I will get the note ID, then I can parse my data and then get the row ID, set the text to the row, row ID, and then put it back in the data uh, base or the file that we have and respond. And this is the same for patch and for put, so a bit of extra code for, your, for the same sort of requests. I could actually implement one function for this and then reuse it in both cases if I like. The last function I have here is the delete function. And it also takes a note here. And I haven't mentioned it before, but I really like this notation that you can say, I want the path of note and then I want this argument here, and the argument should be a bunch of uh, um, uh, numbers. So I'm required to put in something between zero and nine plus times. So it can't be anything here, it needs to be numbers. And I take this, I get my note ID, I get the specific database, and then here we have a little bit of a magic thing. I will unset that row 
And what happens when you unset an, an array row is that you actually get an object with uh, the row numbers as the keys for the specific data. And that's not what I want because I want to remove a row but I still want to keep it as an array. So in order to do that I actually need to do uh, array values of that data object and get only the array values back and not the keys. And then I will put that back into my JSON and I write out the response to the data here as a JSON in code. And the last thing is just running the application. And this is really interesting way to work with this. You can just start it up and you can change things in it on the go. You don't need to recompile anything. This is just a PHP file that you are running. So you start your server and it will host that PHP file and you don't have any build steps. So that's a good plus in my book. It will use Composer which makes me a little bit uh, worried. Uh, so let's look at the actual size of the application with the composer part. So Slim should be small and it's much smaller than other uh, net, uh, these kind of frameworks. It's actually only one megabyte of extra vendor stuff using composer when you have installed everything of it. Um, I know that we are at work building an application that uses a lot larger framework and these kind of applications when you use Composer to get the whole world could reach up to a gig of data or something like that with all the dependencies. So seeing this framework actually only taking up one megabyte of code is really refreshing. So. I would say that Slim is something that is really easy to get up and running. I think it was pretty intuitive and the documentation was gold, even though I had to hunt down specific concepts that I needed to have to get it working. But that's just because I didn't, I haven't seen it before. So that's why I'm not familiar with it. But if you're working with it every day, I think you can get very productive with a Slim framework. So this is my little review of the Slim 4 framework. I hope that you found this interesting. Perhaps you have another tool in your toolbox. If you like, watch my video on this subject so you get more information on how to generate Slim code. If you have any questions, suggestions, or have you used Slim yourself, leave a comment in the comment section down below. If you like this video, give it a like, share it with your friends and colleagues. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do that. And I really hope to see you in the next video.